Hey friends, it's your teen and tween librarian Rebecca and we're back for another episode of Bedtime Stories. Uh, last episode we saw the professor and Oxel take the train all the way up to their to Copenhagen with a few different stops along the way. Um, we learned that Oxel suffers from vertigo, which is going to be a challenge climbing a mountain, I imagine. Um, but he slowly got a little bit over it. So um, he definitely has a strong character as well as a strong stomach. Um, and then lastly, we got to see them take their trip finally on their way to Reykjavik. Um, we got to see some beautiful descriptions of Copenhagen and the areas. Um, but we're really finally getting on our journey. So tonight, they are, they are in Iceland and they are getting ready to start this journey and Oxel takes a bit of a walk around. Um, so let's enjoy chapter nine in Iceland. Chapter nine, we reach Iceland. The day of our departure arrived. The day before, our kind friend, Professor Thompson, had brought us cordial letters of introduction to Count Trampa, the governor of Iceland, Mr. Pictursson, the bishop's coadjutor, and Mr. Finson, the mayor of Reykjavik. In return, my uncle shook him warmly by the hand. On the 2nd of June, at 6 in the morning, our precious luggage was taken on board the Valkyrie, and the captain showed us to our somewhat cramped cabins under a sort of deck house. Is the wind favorable? asked my uncle. Couldn't be better, replied Captain Bjarn. It's a sou'easter. We shall leave the sound at full speed with all sails set. A few minutes later, the schooner, under her foresail, brigantine, topsail, and topgallant sail, got under way and swept through the straits. In an hour, the Danish cap capital seemed to be sinking beneath the waves in the distance, and the Valkyrie was skirting the coast of Elsinore. In my nervous frame of mind, I fully expected to see the ghost of Hamlet wandering on the famous terrace. Sublime madman, I said, you would probably approve of our expedition. You might even come with us to look for the solution of your eternal doubts at the center of the earth. But nothing appeared on the ancient walls. Besides, the castle is much younger than the heroic prince of Denmark. It now serves as a sumptuous lodge for the doorkeeper of the Straits of the Sound, through which 15,000 ships of all nations pass each every year. The castle of Kronsberg soon disappeared in the mist, as well as the tower of Helsingborg standing on the Swedish coast, and the schooner bent lightly under the breezes from the Kattegat. The Valkyrie was a splendid ship, but with a sailing ship, you never know what to expect. She was carrying coal, household utensils, pottery, woolen garments, and a cargo of corn to Reykjavik. The crew consisted of only five men, all Danes. How long will a passage take? My uncle asked the captain. About 10 days, Captain Bjorn replied, provided we don't meet a Norwester while we're passing the Pharaohs. But you aren't liable to suffer a serious delay, are you? No, Herr Liedenbrock, have no fear. We shall arrive in good time. Towards the evening, the schooner doubled Cape Skager, and at the northern point of Denmark, crossed the Skagerrak during the night, skirted the southern point of Norway by Cape Lindness, and entered the North Sea. Two days later, we sighted Peterhead on the coast of Scotland, and the Valkyrie turned her head towards the Faroe Islands, passing between the Orkneys and Shetlands. Soon, our schooner encountered the great Atlantic swell. She had to tack against the north wind and reached the Faroes only with some difficulty. On the 8th, the captain made out Mygones, the most eastern of these islands, and from that moment set a straight course for Cape Portland, the most southerly point of Iceland. The voyage passed without incident. I bore the trials of the sea fairly well. My uncle, to his great annoyance and even greater shame, was sick from beginning to end. He was therefore unable to question Captain Bjorn about Sneffels, the means of communication and transport facilities. He was obliged to put off these inquiries until his arrival and spent all his time lying in his cabin, 
whose walls creaked with every pitch of the ship. It must be admitted that his fate was not exactly undeserved. On the 11th, we passed Cape Portland. The clear weather gave us a good view of Myrdal's Yokul, which dominates it. The cape consists of a big hill with steep sides standing all by itself on the beach. The Valkyrie kept at a fair distance from the coast, continuing westwards through the great shoals of whales and sharks. Soon we came in sight of a huge perforated rock through which the foaming sea was pouring furiously. The Westman Isles seemed to rise from the ocean like a scattering of rocks on a liquid plain. From then on, the schooner took a wide berth to clear Cape Reykjanes, which forms the western point of Iceland. The rough sea prevented my uncle from coming on deck to admire these ragged coasts, battered only by south southwesterly winds. Forty-eight hours later, coming out of a storm which forced the schooner to scud under bare poles, we sighted to the east the beacon on Cape Skager, where dangerous rocks extend far out to the sea. An Icelandic pilot came on board, and three hours later the Valkyrie anchored in the Faxa Bay off Reykjavik. The professor at last emerged from his cabin, somewhat pale and haggard, but as enthusiastic as ever and with a satisfied look in his eyes. The population of the town, immensely interested in the arrival of a ship from which everybody expected something, gathered on the quay. My uncle was in a hurry to leave his floating prison, not to say his hospital. But before leaving the deck of the schooner, he dragged me forward and pointed out to me, to the north of the bay, a high mountain with a double peak, a pair of cones covered with perpetual snow. Sneffels, he cried, Sneffels! Then, with a gesture reminding me to keep absolute silence, he clambered down onto the boat, which was waiting for him. I followed him, and soon we were treading as Icelandic soil. The first man we saw was an impressive figure wearing a general's uniform, but he was just a magistrate, the governor of the island, Baron Trampa, in person. The professor realized at once who he was. He handed the governor his letters from Copenhagen, and a short conversation in Danish followed, in which I took no part, for a very good reason. But the gist of this first conversation was that Baron Trampa placed himself entirely at Professor Liedenbrock's disposal. My uncle was also given a kind reception by the mayor, Mr. Finson, whose dress was just as military as the governor's, but whose temperament and office were no less pacific. As for the bishop's coadjutor, Mr. Picturson, he was on a pastoral tour in the north just then. For the time being, we had to renounce the honor of being presented to him. But we met a delightful man, Mr. Fridrikson, the natural science master at the Reykjavik school, who was extremely helpful. This modest scholar spoke only Icelandic and Latin. He came and offered me his services in the language of Horace, and I felt straight away that we were born to understand each other. In point of fact, he was the only person with whom I could converse at all during my stay in Iceland. This worthy man made over to us two of the three rooms in his house, and soon we were installed in them with our luggage, the amount of which rather astonished the inhabitants of Reykjavik. Well, Axel, my uncle said to me, things are going well, and the worst is over. The worst? I exclaimed. Why, yes, now we have nothing to do but go down. If that's how you look at it, you are right. But after all, when we've gone down, we shall have to come up again, I imagine. Oh, that doesn't worry me. Come, there's no time to lose. I'm going to the library. There may be a manuscript of Sack Newsom's there, and I, if so, I should like to consult it. Then while you are there, I'll wander around the town. Do you want to do the same? Oh, that doesn't appeal to me very much. What's interesting in Iceland isn't above ground, but underneath. I went out and roamed about at random. It would have been hard for me to lose my way in the two streets which make up Reykjavik. I therefore had no need to ask for directions, something which easily leads to misunderstanding when the language of gestures is used. The town stretches, stretches among some low, marshy ground between the two hills. A huge bed of lava lies on one side of it and slopes gently toward the sea. On the other side extends a vast, the vast Faxa Bay, shut in at the north by the enormous Sneffels Glacier, 
and of which the Valkyrie was the only occupant just then. Usually, the English and French fishery protection vessels are anchored in this bay, but at the time they were on duty off the eastern coasts of the island. The longer of Reykjavik's two streets runs parallel with the shore. Here the merchants and shopkeepers live in wooden cabins made of red beams laid horizontally. The other street, more to the west, leads towards a little lake between the bishop's house and the houses of the other people not involved in trade. I had soon walked the whole length of these sad, dismal streets. Here and there I caught a glimpse of a patch of faded turf, looking like an old woolen carpet worn threadbare by use, or else a sort of kitchen garden whose sparse vegetables, potatoes, cabbages, and lettuces, would have figured appropriately on a lily puttian table. Lily puttian table. There are also a few sickly looking wallflowers trying to obtain a little sunshine. About the middle of the non-commercial street, I found the public cemetery, enclosed by a mud wall and with plenty of room in it. Then, a few yards further on, I came to the governor's house, a hovel compared to the town hall of Hamburg, a palace in comparison with the cabins of the Icelandic population. Between the little lake and the town there stood a church, built in the Protestant style out of calcined stones provided by the volcanoes at their own expense. In high westerly winds it was obvious that the red tiles of its roof would take to the air to the peril of the congregation. On a neighboring hill I saw the national school where, as I was later informed by our host, the pupils were taught Hebrew, English, French, and Danish, four languages of which, to my shame, I did not know a single word. If I had gone to that school, I should have been the last of its forty pupils, and unworthy to sleep with them in their little double closets where more delicate children would have died of suffocation on the very first night. In three hours I had seen everything there was to see, not only in the town itself, but also in its environs. The view was remarkably dreary, no trees, and indeed scarcely any vegetation. Everywhere the bare bones of volcanic rocks. The Icelanders' huts were made of earth and peat, with their walls sloping inward so that they looked like the roofs resting on the ground. But these roofs are fields, and comparatively fertile fields at that. Because of the warmth inside, grass grows on them quite thickly, and at haymaking time it is carefully mown, for otherwise the domestic animals would come and graze on these verdant dwellings. During my walk, I met few people. Returning to the main street, I found the greater part of the population busy drying, salting, and loading cod, their chief export. The men looked robust, but clumsy, like fair-haired Germans with pensive eyes, conscious of being somewhat apart from the rest of mankind, poor exiles relegated to this land of ice, and whom nature should have made Eskimos, seeing that she condemned them to live on the edge of the Arctic Circle, I tried in vain to detect a smile on their lips. Now and then their face, facial muscles contracted in a sort of laugh, but they never smiled. Their costume consisted of a coarse jersey made out of black wool, known in the Scandinavian countries as vadmel, a broad-brimmed hat, trousers with a red stripe, and a piece of folded leather by way of footwear. The women, who had sad, resigned faces, quite pretty, but expressionless, were dressed in bodices and skirts of dark vaudemel. The girls wore a little knitted brown cap over their plaited hair while the married women covered their heads with a colored handkerchief with a piece of white linen on top. After a good walk, I returned to Mr. Fridrikson's house, where I found my uncle in company with his host. And that's the end of chapter nine. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Bedtime Stories. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to the library's YouTube channel. You can also find out what's happening at the library by visiting us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Or you can always just go to the library's website. I hope to see you again for the next episode of Bedtime Stories. But until then, be well and sleep well. (laughs) 